All right, welcome to our first church service here at the Cloud Church. My name is Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist to the Spanish-speaking people. I'm glad you could come out. I know we're a small group. We're just getting started, but we're putting out these tapes on the Internet as well, and we hope that uh, you can get a blessing from what you hear here. Um, the Cloud Church is a church that we've put on the Internet for people that just can't go to church. They don't have a way to get out. Either they're elderly or sick. But it's also a place to come if you do have a home to uh, learn more Bible. Uh, there's a lot of uh, churches nowadays that have really gone downhill. I can't tell you how many people I've met that tell me, I just can't go to church anymore. The pastor's not preaching what he used to. And they say things like, well, it's just they don't tell the truth. And all they do is preach on giving money. <laughs> And they say, I just, I don't, I don't get fed anymore. I don't get fed from the scriptures and from the word of God. So what our desire is, we don't want to steal you from your home church. If you do have a home church to go to, go to your own home church. Fellowship with other Christians. But if you do have a home church, go there. But if they're not feeding you the word, come here. If you are a preacher or a Sony school teacher, we encourage you to come here to get information, to learn from the scriptures and take what you learn and preach it in your church. The Bible says in the last days, perilous times shall come. And it talks about a time of apostasy. And I believe we are in that time of apostasy. This church also is for those people that are out of church, that have been going to church but just got discouraged, or maybe somebody said something that kind of hurt their feelings, and they don't want to go to church anymore. But deep down inside, you know you ought to learn the Bible. You ought to be studying. You ought to be serving God. Why don't you come here every week, listen to the sermon, get fed from the Scriptures. There's a great spiritual drought today of the scriptures. And all we want is for you to get the word of God. If the Lord touches your heart to help us financially, mostly we just want your prayers. But if the Lord touches your heart, please give. And we can take this gospel message to more people through the internet. Now, my name is Robert Breaker. I was saved on July 29th, 1992. Uh, a year later, I was out preaching, uh, preaching on the street corners. Um, I was uh, eventually got into Bible school, graduated from the Pensacola Bible Institute in Milton, Florida. Uh, excuse me, Pensacola, Florida. And uh, from there, two weeks later, I went to Honduras as a missionary. I stayed in Honduras for about seven years. I'm working now as a missionary evangelist to the Spanish-speaking people. So this church that we're starting, the Cloud Church, will also be in Spanish. And it is our goal, God willing, and I pray that this would work, that we were able to be able to preach every week a message in English and Spanish and post it on our websites. Also, as a missionary evangelist, sometimes I get invited to other churches to preach. And when I do, we'll tape the message there and put that message on the Cloud Church. I don't want this to just be our main ministry. I want to also be able to do what we've already been doing, which is traveling and preaching the gospel to other people. So I ask you to keep this in prayer, and I ask you to tune in and watch the gospel preached every week. Learn the Bible, learn the scriptures. We want Bible-believing Christians. And I am a King James Bible. Bible believer. I believe only in the King James Bible. It is the inerrant, inspired, infallible Word of God for us today in the English language. And I thank God for the King James Bible. You say, what about all these other versions? Well, there's not time to talk about them. But I will say this. They're, they very deceitfully take out whole verses and whole words of the Bible. If you like the modern NIV version, why don't you look up Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. See if you can find it. Because it's very hard to find because they have taken out the entire verse. Read it without the verse and then put that verse in in the King James and read it and you'll see an entirely different story. One teaches salvation like we do by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ while that version says you're saved by water baptism. Well, which one is it? Are you saved by grace through faith or are you saved by water baptism? Well, according to the scriptures and what we'll learn as we study is you're saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to talk, talk about today in our first message. Our first message being preached on is the message called the gospel. Now, I sure hope that my uh, pens work this morning. Uh, we really want these things to work. We're going to have to buy some more. Looks like it's already running out. Uh, the ink. But we're going to preach on the gospel. I guess I wrote that a little too high that you can't see it. But the gospel. The gospel. What is the gospel? 
Well, as minister, I've traveled to a lot of churches. I've been to probably 200 churches during my lifetime to preach. I've been in, invited. I mean, I called and asked, hey, can I come preach at your church? And I say invited because he says, yes, you may. And so I say I've invited. Well, I've preached in about 200 different churches. And one thing I like to do at the beginning of every service before I preach is say, is anyone here, can anyone here tell me where the gospel is in the Bible? You need to see the Bible says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So if we're supposed to do that, where is it? You know, I've had about five to ten times that I've gotten the right answer. The rest of the times, people just sit there and scratch their head, didn't know the answer. I had a couple people raise their hand and say, well, the gospel, isn't that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Well, they are called gospels because they speak of the gospel. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, even though they speak of the gospel, they're not what's called the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel of Jesus Christ is found in the scriptures. And we're going to look at that right now. We're going to go find 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. This is where it says the gospel. And it's just a sad, sad commentary on the state of the world today that so many people claim to be Christians. Let's make sure this shows up. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 15, verses 1. 1 through 4. But it's just sad that we are in, as the Bible talks about, the days of apostasy, the last days of apostasy. We are in that time period now. And so many people in churches today claim to be Christians, and yet they don't even know what the gospel is. How are we supposed to preach it if we don't know what it is? So Paul says in Romans 1.16, let me read that first, and then we'll go to the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. But in Romans chapter 1, and verse 16, the Apostle Paul tells us, when he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel either. But how can we be ashamed of it if we don't know what it is? So many churches today have apostatized. They've gone off the deep end. There's actually many churches today that are actually serving the New World Order, that are actually working for Satan. The clergy has joined up and they are working together to preach what's called a social gospel. It's a gospel of uh, social justice, they call it, which isn't social justice at all. It's not social and it's not just. It's preaching man's teaching and man's political agenda rather than preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. With that stated, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you know what it is? If I were to ask you the same question, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Could you answer my question? What if I ask, where is it in the Bible? Did you know before I gave you the verses? Think about it for just a second. What is the gospel? Get in your mind the idea. What is the gospel? See if you can answer that question. Have you got it? Now let's see if what you think the gospel is is what the Bible says the gospel is. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, I'm going to read this, it tells us exactly what the gospel is. This is the passage of Scripture in which the Apostle Paul says this is the gospel. So what does it say? It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So the Apostle Paul is declaring unto us what the gospel is. And it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. He says, By which also you are saved. So we're saved by this gospel. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So the Gospel is very plain, very simple. It's right there. It's to the point. And the Gospel actually has five points. Let's put these five points of the Gospel up there. We just read them. We just looked at them. There's five points to the Gospel. Point number one is that Christ died. And I hope this is big enough for you to read. Christ died, point number two, for our sins. And it's interesting to me, there's five points to the gospel, just like there's five bleeding wounds of Jesus Christ on the cross. When Jesus suffered and bled on, and died on the cross, he had five main wounds where the blood poured out of him. So five wounds of Christ on the cross, there's five points of the gospel. Christ died for our sins. And then, I put one too many S's there, excuse me. Christ died for our sins, was buried, 
And then he rose again, thank God, according to the Scriptures. So according to the Scriptures. And I'm abbreviating here. But notice that there's five points to the Gospel. Now, many, many people today, when they preach the gospel, they say, well, the gospel means good news. And that's what they all like to say, well, that work in Greek, the word in Greek is euangelion or whatever it is. And, and gospel actually means good news. So it's the good news of Jesus Christ. Does this sound like good news? Yes, we do get to some good news, but when we start, it's not really good news. Christ died. Does that sound like good news when someone dies? I've personally been to quite a few funerals of family members and people that I love. My, my father passed away. It'll be almost five years now. And it wasn't good news to hear that he died. It's not good news to hear that someone dies. That doesn't sound like good news. Why is it good news? Well, thankfully, the gospel doesn't stop there. Here it says, for our sins. Is that good news? That's right there saying that we're sinners. We're a bunch of sinners. Is that good news to hear that you're a sinner? You might be watching this right now and you're not a Christian. Well, guess what? You're a sinner. That's what the gospel says. Is that good news? Is that good news to hear that you're a low-down, sorry, good-for-nothing rascal, doomed for the lake of fire, doomed to go to hell for all eternity because of your sins? How do you like that? Is that good news? Well, thankfully, the gospel doesn't stop right there. But you know, there's a lot of churches today, this is all they preach. They might say, oh, we believe the gospel, we believe the gospel, but that's all they preach. Christ died for your sins, Christ died for your sins, Christ died for your sins. Well, that's true, he did. But they don't preach the rest of the gospel. I wonder why. I wonder why they don't want to preach all of the gospel. But many, many people just stop right there, if they even know what the gospel is. Many churches don't even know what the gospel is. They totally omit this, and they preach a different plan of salvation that has nothing to do with this whatsoever. What is this? This is the gospel. This is Jesus Christ, and it's Him on the cross. But Jesus just didn't die on the cross and end there. There's more to the gospel than just the death on the cross. You see, most people, they just preach, Jesus died, Jesus died, Jesus died for your sins. And they preach, He died. But they leave it there. They're not preaching the gospel if they leave it there. What's the rest of the gospel? The gospel is that Christ died for our sins and was buried. When Jesus died, he was put into the earth. And the Bible says he was in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Then, now this is the good news, Jesus rose again. Jesus Christ rose again. Only the only people ever to die. And they go down to the heart of the earth and then he rose again. How did he do that? Well, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is God. A lot of people don't understand that or know that. Matter of fact, there's a lot of false religions in the world today that deny that. The Jehovah Witnesses say, no, Jesus Christ wasn't God. That's ridiculous. That's why in their version of the Bible, they changed this verse that I'm about to read. In their version of the Bible, it says, without controversy, great is the mystery of God, and then He was manifest in the flesh. Who is He? Who is He? But I'm reading from First Corinth. Uh, for, excuse me. I'm reading from First Timothy three and verse sixteen, and our King James Bible says, "And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed in the world, received up into glory." So Jesus Christ is God. God died for your sins. What a thing to think about. You've got all these pagans in times past that believed in false gods and their gods were mean and hateful and angry and their gods demanded sacrifice when someone sinned they demanded blood and sacrifice for sin and you know what those gods were so vile and wicked those false gods that they demanded human sacrifice so they would bring and they would sacrifice human beings to these false gods I think of the Mayans and, and the Aztecs and all those that had human sacrifices and they'd take out the heart of a person while still alive and beating. What a horrible, horrible thing. You see, their God's not a loving God. Their gods are gods of hate. They love misery. They love pain. They love watching people die. But our God, oh, our God is a God that loved us enough that He died for us. What a thing to think about that our God is so great that He loved us so much, He saw there was no way for us to save ourselves. 
that he came and he took our sin death, our penalty. He died for our sins. He shed his blood and God died for us. But thank God he rose again because he was God. So the gospel is Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. But here's the last part. According to the scriptures. This is so important that it's mentioned twice in this passage. In verse 3, the end of it says, according to the scriptures. And in verse 4, it says, according to the scriptures. Why is that so important? We see that the scriptures, we have a division. We have the Old Testament before the cross and the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, and here's the New Testament, in the Old Testament, God gave what was called the law. And according to the law, when a man sinned, he had to bring a sacrifice to God. Now, it was very different than the pagan sacrifice. The pagan sacrifices were they sacrificed human beings. Well, God, he asked for a lamb. Sometimes it was a bull or a goat, but most of the time, a lamb. And they would take a lamb in the Old Testament. And the Bible says that man that sinned brought that lamb as a free will offering. Notice that 18 times the Bible says free will offering. That's an amazing thing. We're not Calvinists here. We don't believe in the teachings of John Calvin that men have no free will. You have a free will to accept or reject Jesus Christ. Accept or reject what Jesus did for you. Accept this gospel or reject this gospel. It's up to you. You decide if you want to be saved or not. But in the Old Testament, they brought that lamb, and the Bible said they had to take their hand and put it on top of that lamb and cut the throat of that lamb. And the blood was to pour out of that lamb, and the priest came, and he caught that blood in a cup and offered that blood up on the altar where there was fire. And that was a sacrifice that was made for that man. According to the Scriptures, according to the law, that's how it was done. But when Jesus Christ came, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So Jesus Christ, He died according to the Scriptures. He was the Old Testament Lamb. He died in our place. And thank God, He's the High Priest. Because He offered His own blood up unto God. So today, we're not saved by sacrifices of animals. Thank God, because there wouldn't be enough lambs in the world left for my sins alone. <laughs> I'm a sinner, and... If I would have lived in the Old Testament, whoa, I would have had to sacrifice a lot of lambs. But thank God, Jesus Christ is my lamb who died in my place. And his sacrifice on the cross, according to the scriptures, because the scriptures prophesied that he would come and die for our sins. And thank God, according to the Bible, according to the gospel, if I receive him by faith, if I accept him as my savior, all my sins are forgiven. All of my sins are gone. All of my sins passed. All my sins present. Let me write that in it. And all my sins future. I'll have to put it up on top. All of these sins are forgiven because of what He did. That is so awesome. So when I trust Jesus Christ as my Savior, all the sins I did in the past, all the sins that I'm doing now, all the sins that I haven't even committed yet, He paid for every one of those sins on the cross of Calvary. That's the gospel. And I want to go back and read the passage again. First Timothy, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. And I want to read it again because look at what it says. It says here, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So Paul is writing to the brethren, to the church in 1 Corinthians, and he says, Hey, I want to tell you again what the gospel is. And he says, Which I preached unto you. This is what the apostle Paul preached. This is what we are supposed to preach today. I don't know if you understand the Bible completely. A lot of people don't. But today we're under the ministry of Paul. We're under a Pauline ministry. And this is another video. If you'll click on there, uh, down on my website there, you can see where it talks about rightly dividing and following Paul. That will explain completely how we live in today what's called the church age. And in the church age, God chose Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul, God used Paul to preach this gospel to get people saved. Now someday the church will end in the rapture. And once we leave in the rapture, there'll be a time called the tribulation, seven years, in which the Antichrist will rule the world. And then after that seven year period, Jesus Christ will return and for a thousand years he will rule and reign upon the earth. So it is very, very, very important to understand this message. So what am I preaching? The gospel. It says, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, 
For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. So Paul received this gospel. Now verse 2 says, By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. What does it mean to believe in vain? Well, vain, actually, there's actually a, a magazine today called Vanity. <laughs> There's the word vain. It's self. It's believing in something you do. It's self. So vanity is self. So when Paul says, unless you believed in vain, he means if you're believing in something you did. To believe in what you did to try to work your way to heaven is to believe in vain. And that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is believing in what Jesus Christ did for you. Amen. We're continuing. We had a little power outage there for a minute, but um, we're back. and We're talking about the gospel and the importance of the gospels. Few people nowadays that claim to be Christians actually preach this gospel. Many of them preach another gospel. It's a bloodless gospel. It's a gospel they leave out the blood and they tell people to get to God some other way rather than through the way that God set up for us to get to heaven today, which is through the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, there are many people that aren't preaching the gospel. And we started going verse by verse through the gospel. We saw the five points of the gospel. And let's start there in verse 1 again of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Once again, I'm sorry for the interruption. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 is what we know as the gospel. And verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. So the Apostle Paul preached unto us the gospel. He says it's the gospel we're supposed to stand on. So we're supposed to stand on this gospel. Stand. What does that mean? He says, uh, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto the gospel, which I preached unto you. So we're supposed to preach this gospel. Are you preaching the gospel? If you're a Christian, do you preach this for salvation? Do you tell other people the gospel? of salvation. It says in verse 2, by which also you are saved. So this gospel saves us. Saved from what? Saved from hell. You are only saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ and through receiving that gospel. How do you receive it? By faith. It says, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. And we were looking at how vain or vanity. To believe in vain means you didn't believe to be saved. It was in vain. It was wrong. It means you're believing in something else to get you to heaven. If you're believing in anything else other than this right here to take you to heaven, you're lost. You're believing in vain. What is vain? Vain? Vanity. Believing in vain is to believe in something you've done rather than in what Jesus has done for you. This is what I'd like to you to see today and it's hard to tell off this little prompter here how big or small the words are so if you're watching this on the internet I hope you can see this but there's a difference between the right gospel and the right wrong gospel the right gospel is it is done what Jesus Christ has done for you it's finished notice that this is all finished Jesus died for our sins was buried and he rose again he did all that almost 2,000 years ago salvation is done but today, people want to say, well, no, to be saved, you have to do something. So there is a difference. There is a true gospel, this gospel. It is a gospel of what Christ has done for us. But then you have the false gospel. And any gospel preached today that instructs you to do something is a false gospel that will try to get you to believe in vain and into tricking you into thinking you have to do something to get to heaven. You don't do anything to get to heaven. All salvation is, is trusting in what Jesus did for you. It's believing. It's faith. It's receiving by faith what He did for you. A lot of people don't understand that, but it's so simple. That's why Jesus said even children can understand. The gospel is so plain and simple. And a lot of people understand that the only thing that you can do that's not a work is belief. Have you ever thought about that? Uh, John chapter 6, I believe it says, This is the work of God, that you believe that you believe. So it's not even something that you do that you can claim as a work. When you believe, you just believe. It's not something that you do that you can brag about. It's taking and receiving by faith what Jesus did for you. So the Gospel says in verse 2, By which ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And then it says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. That's a very important word right there, how. I like that word, H-O-W. You know, that's what the gospel is. It's not just that Christ died. It's not just that he died for our sins. It's not just that he was buried. It's not just that he rose again. It's not just that it's according to the scriptures. It's how 
that this was done. How was it done? Well, according to the Bible, it was done in a bloody manner. And this is so important when you preach the gospel. An old preacher one time, many years ago, an old preacher said, you cannot preach the gospel without preaching the blood of Jesus Christ. And you cannot preach the blood of Jesus Christ without preaching the gospel. That is so true today because all throughout the gospel we see the blood of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament salvation was through a blood atonement. Without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins, Hebrews 9.22 says. So the way of salvation from God is through blood. If you sinned, God demanded a blood sacrifice for your sins. When you preach the gospel, you're preaching the blood of Jesus Christ. It says Christ died. Well, immediately we must ask, how? H-O-W. How did God die? There's a famous preacher with a huge church today on TV, and he's written books and everything. And he says, well, it doesn't, it's not important how Jesus died. It's the death that saves us, he says. That's what he always says. It's the death that saves us. It's not important how he died. Well, in that case, then Jesus, when he came, he could have drowned and died for our sins. But no, that doesn't make any sense. Jesus could have been poisoned. Is that, is that making any sense at all? According to him, Jesus could have slipped on a rock and hit his head and passed out and never woke up and he would have died for our sins. No, it's more than just the death. It's how he died. Jesus had to die a certain way. He had to die as our blood sacrifice on the cross for our sins. He had to die a sacrificial sacrificial death for us. He was a blood sacrifice. He had to shed his blood. The Bible says his visage was so marred more than any man. He was so beaten to a bloody pulp that every, every drop of blood spilt out of his body. And as a matter of fact, when they put the lance into Jesus' side, it says, and forthwith came out blood and water. Every single drop of blood was shed from Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh. Shed every drop of blood. It's not just that he died, it's how he died. He died in a bloody manner. It's a blood-stained gospel. Now, for our sins. Did you know that sins is connected with a color in the Bible? In Isaiah 1.18 it says, Come, let us reason together. Though our sins be as crimson, which is the color of blood. Though our sins be as scarlet, which is the color of blood. Now, unfortunately, this is an orange marker, but just pretend that it's red. <laughs> I'm out of red markers. But Jesus died for our sins. Our sins is like the color of red blood. The same color as blood. And it takes red blood to cover sins. He was buried. Where, does, where was Jesus buried? He was buried in the same ground that his blood shed into. Matter of fact, in Hebrews, it talks about how when Abel died, his brother's blood cried out from the ground. I mean, uh, Cain killed Abel. And it says Abel's blood cried out to God from the ground. And then it says, and how much more does the blood of Christ speak? So God's blood, when it was shed into the dirt, it cried out to God, according to Hebrews. He rose again. Now, a lot of people don't preach this, but when Jesus died, he shed his blood, and then he rose again, and the Bible says he took up with him his blood to the mercy seat in heaven and sprinkled it in the mercy seat of heaven. Read the book of Hebrews to read that. So Jesus Christ took his blood up onto the mercy seat in heaven. Just like that Old Testament priest took that blood and offered it upon the altar as forgiveness. And according to the scriptures, the scriptures are full of Old Testament sacrifices of blood. And the scriptures say you must have a blood atonement. A blood atonement. Jesus Christ is our blood atonement. You can't preach the blood without preaching the gospel. You can't preach the gospel without preaching the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. It's the blood. Um, let me read e e Ephesians 1.7. Almost all denominations in the world, almost all religions, they all seek to profess to want one thing. They all say they want forgiveness of sins. But yet they all say the only way to get it is through your works. So they say you have to do something to get to heaven. You have to work your way to heaven. Is that true? Is that how we get the forgiveness of sins? Ephesians 1 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, speaking of Jesus. And then it says, The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So, according to the Bible, the forgiveness of sins is through the blood. 
It's not through what we do, it's through what Jesus Christ did for us. The same verse is found in Colossians 1.14. It almost says the exact same thing with very little difference. So I read Ephesians 1, 7. I'll go ahead and read Colossians 1, 14, which, by the way, is changed in new versions of the Bible. Better be careful with those new Bible versions. It says in Colossians 1, 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, comma, even the forgiveness of sins. So our sins are forgiven through the gospel, through the blood of Jesus Christ, by accepting what he's done. So what you have Let's see if I can put it up here. Sorry, I don't have an eraser. But you have today people that are preaching something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're preaching a works plan of salvation. Put an S right there. Works. When the gospel of Jesus Christ is believing the finished work of Jesus Christ. What he did for you. Do you see the difference? We are not saved today by our own works. You say, well, what if I never sinned? That's impossible. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says uh, there's none righteous. No, not one. Everyone is a sinner. There's no one that's ever lived that never sinned except one, Jesus Christ. And because he was God manifest in the flesh. He that knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What does that mean? That means he took all of our sins on him. And he said, God, I'm dying for their sins. I'll take their chastisement. I'll, take, I'll pay for their sins. And that's what Jesus did. He that never sinned took all the sins of the whole world on him and paid for them. And now if you come to him and trust his gospel, then you have the forgiveness of sins. It's through believing what Jesus did. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But yet today they preach a works-based salvation. Well, if you do this, if you go to church, if you get baptized, if you do good works, if you speak in tongues, if you do all these things, then maybe, maybe you'll, you'll get saved and go to heaven. No. The Bible says it's the work of Jesus. It's what He did. I call it the finished work of Jesus Christ. By what He did, we can be saved if we accept what He did by faith. But if we try to work our way to heaven, what are we doing? We're spitting in the face of God. Have you ever thought about this? If you think you can get to heaven based upon what you do, then you're saying what Jesus did is meaningless. It's worthless. It was for naught, for nothing. Jesus died for nothing if we can save ourselves by our own works. But if we can't save ourselves by our own works, then the only way to be saved is through what He did for us. The Bible calls Him the Savior. A savior is someone who saves others. Why? Because they can't save themselves. We can't save ourselves. A lot of people say, well, I keep the law. And following the law, and if I keep the law, then I'll, I'll be saved by keeping the law. No one's ever kept the law. Matter of fact, you've never kept the law. When was the last time you sacrificed a lamb for your sins? Uh, never. So what does Galatians 2, verse 16 say? I'll read this to you. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. It's not by works. It says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. And it says, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Wow. It doesn't get much plainer than that. You're not justified by the works of the law. You're justified by trusting in what Jesus Christ did. I want to go to Romans real quick. That word justified, that's a neat word. That's a very amazing word. And in, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 28, it says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Romans 3, 28. So justification, which is salvation, is without the words of the law. So let me see if I can find some room up here. I always like to write a lot and I seem to always uh, take up too much space. But look at that word, just if I'd, justified. That's the word justified. Let's break that up into three words. If you break that into three words, it's just if I'd. To be justified is to be just if I'd never sinned because you're forgiven. And when you're forgiven, you're justified. When you're justified, you're forgiven. That means your sins are paid for. And to be justified, it's just if I'd never sinned. How are you justified? By faith. Romans chapter 5, 
uh, verse 1 says the exact same thing. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, speaking to Christians, it says much more than being now justified by His blood. It all goes back to the blood. The faith and the belief in the gospel. The faith and the belief in the blood. Because you can't preach the blood without preaching the gospel. You can't preach the gospel without preaching the blood. The faith in the blood. The faith in the atonement of Jesus Christ is what justifies us. Because we're trusting what He did, not what we did. We're trusting in the done gospel, not the I have to do something to be saved gospel. We're trusting in the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ, and not our own works to get to heaven. Now let me tell you how I got saved. When I was younger, I went to uh, a lot of churches. My mom went to one denomination, my dad to another. And sometimes they'd compromise and meet in the middle and go to a, one together. But I used to go to Assembly of God Church. And before that, I went to Southern Baptist churches, Independent Baptist churches, all sorts of different denominations. In my whole life, I always thought, well, you have to do something to be saved. So I tried my best to be a good person. Try not to smoke, to drink, to cuss, to chew, to run with them that do. I did everything I could to live for Jesus. I thought, well, I must be a Christian. But I kept thinking, i got to do something. i got to do something. I'd pray every night, oh God, please save me. People say, pray the sinner's prayer. Well, I'd pray it every single night, sometimes three or four times a night. Why did I keep doing that if it didn't work? Well, it didn't work because I thought the prayer saved me. So I thought, well, if I do the prayer, then I'll get to heaven. See, I was trusting in my works. And I went through and, and listened to denominations preach to me and tell me, yeah, you've got to try this, you've got to do that, you've got to do this. I did everything they said to do. And I was as lost as a golf ball in high weeds. I never heard the gospel until I was 18 years old. That's when I sat down and my dad said, Son, I want to ask you a question. I said, Yeah, Dad. He said, Son, are you saved? I said, um, yeah, yeah, I'm saved. He said, why? I said, because I'm a good person. My dad took me through the Bible and he showed me some Bible verses and he showed me the verses that say you're not saved by your works. You're not saved by doing good. You're not saved by what you do. You're saved by what Jesus Christ did for you. He said, now son, are you saved? I said, well, yeah, yeah, I did this and I was baptized. He said, let me show you some Bible verses. Baptism in water does not save you. If it does, why did Jesus die? If we can get to heaven by baptizing in water, then Jesus came to this earth, lived 33 years, and died on the cross for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Because that's meaningless. We could get to heaven by water baptism instead. But it does not save you. Do you understand that? So my dad showed me some verses and he said, Son, are you saved? I said, Well, um, I'm a good person. I, I, I was baptized. I spoke in tongues. He said, Let me show you some Bible verses, son. And you know, speaking in tongues isn't what people think it is today. In the Bible, the tongue is a written, spoken language. If you're speaking in tongues, you're speaking in a language that someone else can understand. But yet, there's many denominations in the world today that say it's just blabbering into the air. Blah, 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 And they say things and they don't know what they say. Well, that's not what the scriptures speak. On Pentecost, when they spoke in tongues, they were speaking another language. And someone understood and they heard the preaching of the scriptures in that language. And every time there's tongues mentioned in the Bible, it's in the context of preaching to someone else. So if someone doesn't understand that, then it's in vain. And it's not biblical if you're speaking into the air and no one understands it. So he showed me what the Bible shows, shows about that. And he kept saying, are you saved? And he was taking away everything from me that I was trusting in, thinking I'm getting to heaven because I did this, because I had the do gospel. If I do, 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 God will accept it. But he said, son, are you saved? And I said, well, I, I don't know. He said, would you like to know? I said, yes, I would. My dad brought me here. He showed me the gospel of what Jesus Christ did for me. And it began to dawn on me, hey, it's what he did, not what I can do that get, gets me saved. And after showing me so many verses of the Bible, so many scriptures, my dad took me to Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. And this is the verse that I got saved reading. And it was like this. My dad said, son, can you read this to me? And I said, okay, dad. And I sat down and I started reading Romans 3.25. It says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. And he said, son, do you know what a propitiation is? And I said, well, let me go get the dictionary. You know, there's a lot of big words in the Bible. A lot of them are just used in, in the Bible. We hardly ever use them today. So my dad said, no, no, don't go get the dictionary. Let me explain it to you. The propitiation, he said, is like a substitute. Now, I've looked it up since in the dictionary. It literally means the act of appeasing wrath. 
And Jesus Christ appeased the wrath of God for our sins when he paid for our sins. But my dad explained it to me as like a, pro a propitiation is like a substitute. He said, son, what if you went down to McDonald's and you shot five people in cold blood? He said, you think that'd be awful? I said, well, yeah, dad, that, that'd be horrible. He said, you went down to McDonald's and you shot people in cold blood. You deserve to go to jail and you deserve to go electric chair. Do you agree? I said, yeah. yeah. If I murdered five people, I deserve to die. I deserve to pay for what I've done. My dad says, what if they sit you down in the electric chair and you're sitting there and your hands are strapped in? And he says, what if I come in and I say, let him go. I'll take his place. I'll die for him in his place. I said, wow, Dad, would you do that? He said, no. <laughs> he said, but son, that's what Jesus Christ did for you. And for the first time in my life, it was like a light bulb clicked, or something clicked in my brain, like a light bulb went off, and I was like, Jesus Christ died for my sins in my place. He took my, my payment. I don't have to pay for my sins in hell. I don't have to try to do good hoping I'll get to heaven. I just trust what He did. And I understood Jesus did this for me. And my dad said, now read the rest of the verse. So I went to Romans 3.25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, or like a substitute, through faith in His blood, the Bible says, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And right there, right there, I, I saw Jesus Christ did this for me. If I'd trust His blood, He'd save me. And right there, my faith was puesto, puesto as we say in Spanish, my faith accepted by faith I received Jesus as my Savior because I believed and I trusted the shed blood of Jesus Christ And my dad said well so son when did you get saved I said right now I said right now I see it I understand it I believe it Jesus died for me he shed his blood and I'm trusting that blood for the forgiveness of my sins and my dad said amen son that's all it is salvation is so simple it's believing it's resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ you see before I was trusting in what I did then I realized it's not what I do to get to me to heaven because the best I could do would still never be good enough for God because it's the work of a sinner but when I trust what Jesus did then I'm forgiven then he can accept me and it says whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood but then it says to declare his righteousness before I was trying to say I'm righteous I'm righteous because I'm doing good works and I'm righteous look at me God I'm so righteous and God looked at me and said what a dirty rotten sinner still gonna die in his sins but then I repented of what I believed in I turned from trusting in myself and my own righteous and my own works and I trusted in the done gospel trusted in what Jesus did and that declared him righteous see there's many people in many churches today and many religions that are trying to declare themselves righteous. They're trying to say, look at me, I'm a good Christian, and I do this, and I go to church every week and never miss it, and I do this, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I. What are they doing? They're bragging upon themselves. They're bragging upon what they do. They're trying to say, look at me, God, at what I did. And God says, no, look at what I did for you. I don't care what you do. What are you going to do with what I did for you? My forgiveness, God says, only comes through trusting the shed blood that I shed for your sins. Will you accept it or reject it? And they reject them. They say, I'm more righteous than you, God. You know what? That's what the Pharisees believed. That's why the Pharisees killed Jesus Christ. Because they thought they were more righteous than he was. And they saw him live in a righteous life. They saw him never sin. They saw him preach with authority and say, I am God in the flesh. I have come. And they said, we cannot have this man to rule over us. We cannot repent of what we are. We cannot change. We are better than him. Kill him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. And they killed the Lord of glory because they were self-righteous. They thought they were right and God was wrong. And the only way to be saved, friend, the only way to be saved is to realize you're wrong and Jesus Christ is right. You can never get to heaven based upon what you do. It's vanity. You can only get to heaven trusting what Jesus did for you. If you can get to heaven apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, apart from Him dying on the cross, then why did He die? Many people say, oh, you want to get to heaven? Just repeat this prayer after me. The prayer will save you. Well, if a prayer saves you, why did Jesus die? 
Why didn't he just stay up in heaven and send another prophet and say, now tell everybody just to pray and ask me to save them and I'll save them. He didn't do that. Jesus had to come. He had to live 33 years. He had to die on the cross for our sins. And now he says, come unto me. You know, you can pray. We're not against prayer. God's not against prayer. But if you think you're saved by the prayer, you're not going to be saved because that's something that you do. You're not saved by what you do. Well, you say, well, I'm not saved. What, what should I do? Well, the only thing you can do that's not a work is believe. So the best thing to do is go to God in prayer. Yes, pray and say, God, I trust you. I give up everything I've done because nothing I can do will please you. And I accept wholeheartedly what you've done for me. You see, the prayer doesn't save you. The faith saves you. And you know, you can believe while you're praying. Or, like in my case, you can believe without praying. I was saved that day when God showed me the scripture and I believed it. And I didn't even utter a prayer. My father, he was saved while praying. I've led people to the Lord and they got saved while they prayed. But I've also met other people that got saved without praying. Prayer doesn't save you. Prayer is speaking and talking to God. If you're lost, it doesn't hurt. Just say, God, I come to you now as a sinner, and I do receive you. I accept what you God, I heard what he said, and I do believe it. I trust what you did is sufficient to save me. I know that I can't get to heaven on my works. It's what you did that saves me, not what I can do. If you believe, you're saved. You can be saved in prayer, but you're not saved by the prayer. It's whether or not you believe. And you see, this is the problem. I can't see your heart. I don't know what you're trusting in. My dad used to always look at somebody in the eye and say, let me ask you this right here. Put his finger in him and say, if you were to die right now and stand eyeball to eyeball with Jesus Christ, and he were to say, why should I let you into heaven, how would you respond? You know, that's, that's a good question. I've seen people respond to my dad in many different ways. But that's a good way to try to figure out what someone's believing in. Some people say, well, I'm a good person. Well, guess what? They're lost because they're trusting in what they did. Others say, well, I've been baptized or, oh, well, I did this or I did. If your response is, I did such and such, you're probably not saved. You see, when someone asks me that, I say two words, the blood. That's it, the blood. I have received what Jesus did for me by faith. I believe. It's not something that I did. See, believing is not a work. What is a work? We've read, we've read Ephesians uh, 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What is a work? It's something you can boast about doing. I can't boast and say, I'm saved because I did this or this or this. I can't say that. I'm saved because He did it for me. I received it by believing. It wasn't a work that I did to get it. I just believe it. And that's why I'm saved. Are you saved? Have you trusted the finished work of Jesus Christ? I've tried to preach to you today the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to see you saved. If you are saved, praise God. Take this message to the world. We're trying to reach the world through the internet, through the cloud church, taking the message of the gospel. And notice what the emphasis is on. The emphasis is on what he did in shedding his blood for our sins. If you hear anyone preach anything else and say, Oh, I want to preach the gospel, but all the emphasis is on man or what you do or what you can do, you're hearing a perverted gospel. Paul says in Galatians 1, and I'll end here in a minute, but in Galatians chapter 1, we have a very strong warning about people preaching another gospel. That's why it's so important to make sure you're preaching the right gospel. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, and that which we have preached, this is what he preached, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, he says, Let them be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. Are you preaching another gospel? There is a bloodless gospel being preached today. There is a different gospel preached in many churches, and it's so sad, that says, well, just do this to get to heaven. But that won't save you. It's not a do gospel. That's a bloodless gospel. The true gospel is a blood-stained gospel. It's a gospel of preaching what Jesus has done for sinners. It's a gospel that's finished. 
It's a gospel that God Himself gave to us. And your sins can be forgiven by trusting in what Jesus Christ did for you. If you're saved today, we rejoice with you. Uh, write us. Get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Come back every week and learn more from the scriptures of the teaching of the Word of God. And if you're not saved, you need to be saved. Your immortal soul is so important. There's only one of two places that you can go when you die. Heaven or hell. I don't want to see you go to hell. God doesn't want to see you hell. go to hell. The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God is long-suffering. He wants people to be saved. But it depends on whether or not you of your own free will accept or reject what Jesus Christ has done for you. If you're lost, I encourage you, watch this over if you don't understand it. Listen, look up the verses, read for yourself to see what the Bible says about salvation. Because salvation is simple. It's by childlike faith in what Jesus Christ did for you. Thank you and God bless you and thank you for watching.